Voy a contarles un poco de qué se trata el recorrido de John. Es muy interesante. John es de Nueva Zelanda, es profesor, investigador y director de Melbourne Education Research Institute de la Universidad de Melbourne, Australia. El profesor Hattie es aclamado internacionalmente por su influyente libro Visible Learning. Es considerado el mayor estudio en datos cuantitativos del mundo sobre los factores que mejoran el aprendizaje de los estudiantes. Además, es un prestigioso ponente internacional. Ha participado en una multitud de conferencias internacionales y de charlas como las charlas TED. Good afternoon, Professor Hattie. Thank you very much for participating in this amazing Education Congress. Please let us enlighten you with your ideas. Well, thank you very much, Melina. And if only, only I could be there in person, it would be wonderful, but that's not to be given what's happening in our world at the moment. So, buenos dias to you all. And my session today was I want to talk about the opportunity that COVID has given us to look at how we want to transform our schooling, how we can truly learn from this experience, even though I'm sure there's a lot of sadness um, in, in this occasion, but how we can learn from this experience to make the difference. And where I like to start with all my presentations is anchoring it in the research. And what I've been doing for the last many years is trying to take all the different influences that we can think of on student achievement and place them along a single continuum trying to identify those things, obviously up at the enhanced end that we would like to keep. Anything around the zero point we don't want and certainly no one wants to do things that decreases kids' achievement. I acknowledge that there are many other things that you do in schools besides affecting kids' achievement. Motivation, physical health, nutrition, and one that probably is most dear to my heart is, are our schools inviting places for kids to come to? One of the best predictors of adult health, wealth, and happiness is not achievement at school. It is the number of years of schooling. Hence the notion of making schools inviting is pretty important. But I make no excuse for also including achievement. The other criticism I often get is that you can't do this. You can't put everything along a continuum because it would differ. My children are different. What happens here in South America is different to what happens in the United States and in Australia. Five-year-olds are different from 20-year-olds. Kids are at the top of the distribution. What, what affects them is different to what happens to kids at the bottom of the distribution. And they're all questions that we can answer using our meta-analysis methods. And that if you change the nature of the children, does it change the distribution? And the answer is no. No, it doesn't. And so whilst, of course, your kids are unique, what works best with four-year-olds works best with 20-year-olds, what works best in South America works best in the US, Australia, etc. Now, one of the key things, though, is that whilst I can show you what the effects are across this whole distribution, you still have to pay attention to how you implement what happens at the top end, at that blue end, in your classroom. Because if you don't implement with fidelity, then of course it's not going to have the same impact, which is why I argue that you should know thy impact. What is the impact you're having in your class? Since I published Visible Learning 10 years ago, I've doubled the number of matter analyses. I now have over 300 million, quarter of a billion students. The story is pretty much the same. Of course, there's a lot more data. And there is the 300 million students. And it never ceases to amaze me when I, I look at this graph. I expected when I started to have a lot more of the influences in that red zone below zero. And there's not much there. And quite a bit of what's in that red zone is perfectly sensible. Like the effect size of bullying on achievement is minus 0.3. I use the average of all influences, my 0.4 mark, and I'm interested in what's the difference between those in the blue zone and those in the yellow zone. And notice there's a lot of schools and teachers already in that blue zone. Excellence is all around us. And the visible learning story is this simple. Do you have the courage to reliably identify those teachers and schools in the blue zone in your countries, form a coalition of success around them, and then invite 
those in the yellow zone to join. And my challenge to you here today is where are you? In the blue zone, permission to keep doing what you're doing. In the yellow zone, I'm sorry, you are going to have to change. It's not good enough that down the corridor is another teacher who is in the blue zone compared to you, who's got the same kids, the same curriculum, the same assessment, the same school leadership, who is having much greater effect on their students. And so that's the, the big picture. I'm looking at the effects of achievement. I'm looking at identifying not what works, but what works best. And that is what's the common denominator in the yellow zone. Now this session isn't about all the detail, but if you wanna to go to that site, it's a free site on the web on your iPhone, you can get every one of the influences. And I updated it every now and then with all the new meta analyses. So all the detail is available on that Meta X site. So you can go there for the detail. Let me give you a bit of a flavor. Look down those. Which of those do you think are in the blue zone? Which are in the yellow? And which are in the red? If you don't know what it means, skip over it. There's enough there. I'll give you a moment to decide which are in the yellow zone, blue zone, and red zone. And I put it to you that quite a few of these influences are the ones that we love to talk about in the press, amongst the politicians, and in the staff rooms. And none of them are greater than 0.4. Oh, yes, the positive. So, of course, there's evidence that they do enhance kids' learning. But they're tiny. And I put these up to contrast them with the next slide to say these are the things that quite frankly, yes, we can do some of those, but they're not gonna make the difference to kids learning. Because look at those effect sizes compared to those. They're ginormous. They, these big seven ideas double the rate of learning. And I think that's pretty impressive. And look at them, none of them include a child, none of them include a curriculum, none of them include a teaching method. They're all about how you think. Teachers working together, evaluating their impact, by far the most important. And this is where we need a lot more collegial, collective impact, looking at teachers, creating time for teachers to work, work, work together to evaluate their impact. And it begs the question, what you mean by impact? If a teacher thinks a year's growth for a year's input is just a tiny bit, and another teacher thinks it's very, very large, then we know that both those teachers will be very successful, sadly, wonderfully. And so how do you articulate what you mean by a year's growth? Are you prepared to bring along to the next staff meeting a piece of child's work now and say three months later and have a discussion about whether that's three months growth? If you don't deal with those kinds of matters, then you're not going to make the difference in terms of what's happening in your classes and in your schools. And clearly understanding that notion of impact comes directly to having high expectations. And teachers who have high expectations tend to have it for all the students. And sadly, teachers with low expectations have it for all the students. And how we can articulate what those expectations are, not just to our colleagues, but making them explicit through the success criteria to our students. So as they start a series of lessons, and certainly as we're finding out in our COVID experiments and work, that if we don't make it very clear up front with milestones through the lessons about what success looks like, students get off track very, very quickly. And how in those success criteria do we get this principle of challenge, this Goldilocks principle of challenge, where we want to set the success criteria, not too hard, not too easy, and not too boring. And up to about the age of eight, most students will do what we ask them to do anyway. After that, they want to be challenged, and our job is to turn them on to the challenge of learning. And we do that in a way by recognising what they know at the start. And one of our big problems in our schools is so often children are given work to do that's too easy, and that is just not challenging, that's just not exciting, and they start to turn off this game called learning. 
We have to give them work that they don't know how to do, which means errors should be welcomed. Errors should be seen as opportunities to learn. If I came into your class and asked a student, what do you do when you don't know what to do or you don't know what the answer is? Most students say they put their hand up. Watch them. No, they don't. The kids who put their hand up know the right answer. And the whole ethos of the classroom is about getting things right. You don't come to school to learn that which you already know. So we have to make errors welcomed. And in doing that, we have to continually seek feedback to us about our impact. Our impact about what? Our impact about who? And our impact about how big is our effect? And have that relentless focus on learning. Let's stop our discussions about teaching. I don't care how any one of you teach. I invite you not to have more discussions about a resource, best practice, another teaching method. I don't care how you teach. I care about the impact of your teaching. So when I take these big seven ideas, it then comes to my mantra about how we can see learning through the eyes of the students. If you look at Graham Nuttall's research, one of the things he found is 80% of what happens in your classroom, you don't see or hear. So why should I care about the teacher reflection of the 20%? I want resources in your classes. I want other people to come in your class and watch your impact through the eyes of the students. I want to talk to your students about what it means to be a learner in this class. And if they say a learner in this class is someone who comes with their work prepared, done their homework, sits up straight and watches the teacher work, I don't think we've got a very productive classroom. Learning's messy. Learning is full of error and opportunity. And the struggle, which should be a good word, the struggle of learning is what we want to indulge kids in. And when I look at the bottom word, and oh my goodness, is that so important in our COVID days. We have lots of words for it, self-regulation, lifelong learning, metacognition. But I think it's easier to say. We want our students to see themselves as their own teachers. And one of the big factors in the COVID is that students who have those skills are more likely to succeed and thrive, actually, when they're working without the teacher over them all day. So let me come to this unfortunate situation that we're in and turn it into an opportunity. I think if I'd gone to my university ethics department and asked for permission to close all schools around the world, make sure all kids went home and teachers had to spend an incredible amount of workload readjusting how they teach, I wouldn't be allowed to do it. But that's the scenario we're in. And there are lots, as I said before, there are lots of sad, sad things about it. But one of the things I'd ask you to think about is what the nature of teaching will be in a COVID situation. Before COVID, what was the main way in which you went about teaching your class? And then after COVID, whilst they're at home, at distance, what are the main things in terms of your model of teaching? Because one thing we know already, and we here in Australia have been through various waves, and we're now in lockdown five at the moment with schools all closed again. And so we've been through the various waves and we've learned that in the before COVID days, the dominant way is we talk a lot. We talk on average around 80% of the time. We are very much in charge. We're very much overseeing the students. We're engaging them in a lot of doing, doing activities. That is not going to be successful when they're working from home. We then move into a triage, the notion of where we listen to where the students are. We listen to what problems they're having. We're then modifying what we're doing. And certainly what happened here in Australia, where schools went out at the start of the year into COVID, then the notion up front is we structured materials and we gave it to the kids to do. When they were by themselves, some of them couldn't do it. Some of them did the wrong stuff. And they got very frustrated, as did their parents. In the second wave we went through, we were much more careful about giving students steps along the way and so asking them to check. If it looks like this, then you're going in the right direction. We spent a lot more time putting students in groups, getting them to work without the teacher so they could feed from each other. And the materials were structured much more carefully around various steps in the success criteria. And we, as teachers, were much more receptive to listening, not just talking. I want to explore that. 
The current grammar of schooling in classrooms is we do talk a lot. We do ask between 150 to 250 questions a day that require, on average, less than three words response from students. Most of the talking we do in class, most of the feedback we give, oral and written, is about the facts, the content. And we slice the students, we dice them, we standardize the curriculum, we group, we track, we segregate. Now, don't get me wrong, I've shown you the evidence. It's a reasonable method. It works for a reasonable number of kids, or put it another way. The kids have worked out how to play this game called schooling. And there's a conspiracy. The conspiracy is students above average like it. They want you to talk more. They want more facts. They know how to play that game. It's the students below average who most want you to shut up and listen to how they're thinking and get them to listen to how other students and the teacher is thinking and processing the information. That model won't work in COVID. 80% of the regular classroom, but is that good enough? And by 80% is 80% of work has to play the game, not necessarily a thriving in that situation. And I don't think a system is good enough. So my invitation to you is to pay particular attention during the COVID distance learning model and work out what works really well into that model so that when we do come back, and one day we will, to in-class teaching, we bring back better. And this is the new model, and this is the focus of what the whole visible learning message is about, where we can hear students thinking and not just have them report on someone else's thinking on their own. We have a much more balance between open and closed questions. And you're going to find that in students working at distance, you're going to have to have more open questions. So it's not just a right or wrong. You're going to have to build on their elaborations and how they go about evaluating. We're going to have to get the students to rephrase, reason and challenge, and not us do all the rephrasing, reasoning and challenging. And we're going to have to constantly check how well we're going in terms of the work we're giving the students. We may have to narrow the, some of the content so that we can go deeper on some. Now, I want both. I want content and I want deep. But to get to content and to deep, sometimes you have to give up some of the content. And absolutely, we're going to have to teach the students very quickly how to engage in self-regulation or to become their own teachers. And how are we going to get the parents to be involved, not in giving right and wrong answers, which is how some parents still think what schools were like, but how we may get parents to work with their children to say, well, let's work out how we're going to ask the teacher that question. Let's say failure is our friend. And if we're doing failure, then we are at the edge of learning. And so let's learn from what we don't know and let's work with our parents, with our students to help them phrase it back so we don't get into this trap that everything has to be right and wrong, which is the old grammar of schooling. So let me be more specific about COVID. As I'm trying to argue, we know a tremendous amount of what works. We know, for example, what those top big seven ideas are, and we know that we can implement those when the kids aren't in front of us all the time if we remember that one of the things we must do continually is this gradual release of responsibility and under COVID it will be a faster gradual release of responsibility. When I look at the seven million students that have been studied in distance education you can see the effect size is very small. If anything it's slightly in favour of distance education for the reasons I've been talking about. Students start to learn. They're going to have to take more responsibility for their learning and not overly depend on the teacher. But the major message from these matter analyses is that the medium doesn't matter much. Good teaching online is good teaching. Bad teaching online is bad teaching. Same with the regular classroom. So having it at distance isn't such a big difference, but we must exploit that advantage of distance. If we lose 10 weeks of schooling, you can see the effects aren't that great. Not that great for most kids, pretty damn small. <clears throat> and when I look at, for instance, Colombia as one example, and you can see Colombia, like Australia, has one of the longest school days and school years in the world, in the Western, in the OECD world. And so this is a graph of the number of hours that you spend. 
And you can see up the top, uh, number five, is Finland, which has a much shorter school day and school year. And if I take 10 weeks off from Colombia, you can see all those countries still outperform your country and my country with less time and less school day. So the fact that the school day is less isn't the major point. It's what you do when you have them. And I had a situation here in Australia not so long ago where I was asked on national television where some parent came in and said, my child only spends two hours a day learning at home. And my reaction was, that may be more than they spend in the five to six hours they do in the regular classroom. And so a new word will come into our business. Not only do we care about how effective we are, we're going to be more concerned about how efficient we are and making sure that if the students achieve the success criteria, that is what we want to aim for. And some of our students are already saying, I want to stay at home forever because I'm much more efficient. I don't understand why I waste all that time at school. And so that's one of the things we need to learn when we come back to in-class is how can we be more efficient and allow the students benefits if they do it in a shorter amount of time than the amount of time that's been allocated for the lesson. When I look at previous research on earthquakes, in fact, I was involved living in New Zealand when the Christchurch earthquakes happened. And there was a big argument that in that year, the students in their final years of schooling would be disadvantaged because they'd lost their schools. They literally lost their schools and they had to do everything far distance. And I argued on the qualifications authority are on not to give them any dispensation. And I argued that the students actually would be better that year. And sure enough, they were. Because rather than teachers saying, come to my class and I'm going to tell you what you need to know, teachers went into a triage motion. And they said, let's listen to what you do know and you don't know, and let me tailor more to you and to the group of students like you, how we can give you some lessons related more specifically about what you know and you don't know. So teachers became much more involved in good diagnosis and then didn't just assume that everyone in the class needed the lessons that they were going to, going to teach. That's something we need to learn to go into COVID. When I look at the floods, and I particularly look at Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, and we know what happened in that state where they, schools were washed out again. Well, actually, when the kids came back to school, they actually slightly did better afterwards. They had an initial drop of minus 0.6. Afterwards, they actually improved in their schools because teachers learned how to bring back better from the situation and how to be much more efficient in the time they had. And similarly, when I look at strikes, I particularly looked at the Canadian strike of a few years ago, where they had 11 strikes in one year over quite a period of time. And you can see in grade three, there was a slight dip. Grade six, they slightly went up. Once again, don't think that time on task is necessarily the problem. It's that what we do with the time that we have. Technology. Wow. This is the revolution been coming for the last 50 years. We know the average effect size of interventions using computers and technologies is very small. In the regular grammar of schooling, where we talk a lot, technology has not helped us a lot. But there is one massive advantage of technology, particularly in today's world. I'm sure all of your students are very good on the social interaction aspects of technology. Well, it turns out that that is probably the most powerful use also in the school. It is a very powerful way to get students talking with each other, creating short videos, using the, the, the skills of typing to each other and to you to check for understanding. And I remember a few years ago when we were doing our work trying to get students to talk more about their errors and what they didn't know. And I remember the student and he was talking to the teacher. And the teacher was saying, well, what is it you don't understand? You know, tell me what you're thinking. And the, the boy was saying, I don't have a problem. It's OK. And she knew he did. And she looked over his shoulder and he was typing in his social media platform that they were using. He was typing to the teacher the question about the problems he was having. And we realized that students nowadays are more likely to use the technology to think aloud than they are to speak aloud in the classroom, particularly to a teacher and particularly in front of their peers. Because their peers often say, oh, there goes old silly, doesn't understand it again. Don't interrupt the teacher's flow. And so using the technology, particularly in our COVID days, 
to get the students to keep a learning log, to keep a learning diary about what they're understanding, what they're not understanding, how you can use social media like I'm doing with you here today to say to the students, talk to me about what you're doing. They're more likely to do it over the internet than they are in the regular classroom. And that's one of the major reasons that the effect sizes of distance learning are slightly larger, is that there are more opportunities to do those one-on-one -on -one interactions. Now, to do it in an efficient way and ask the students, as they're doing the work, to keep a learning log, to be a learning detector, and to talk about what they don't know and what they don't know, where they're stuck, where they're having struggles, and they're more likely to do that. And so you'll see that this is a, a major asset in our COVID days that we have to remember when we bring back better to the regular classroom. And yes, parents. Too many parents think schoolwork is getting it right or wrong. Kids who get lots of things right are doing well. Well, if kids are getting lots of things right, they're probably not being challenged. They're probably not being stretched. And so one of the things that we can use our COVID experience for is to teach our parents about the language of learning. And many parents will realize very quickly that they don't have the expertise you have. I remember the day when after the first wave here in Melbourne, the schools reopened. And if you put your head out the window, you could hear the collective sigh of relief from many parents saying, that was just too hard. I didn't know how to go about doing things when my child didn't know. And we have to say to those parents, that's the learning opportunity. Talk with your students about what they don't know, where they're struggling. Feed it back to me as the teacher. Get your students to feed back to me, not the parent, because you don't have the time to deal with all the parents, but get the parent to work with the child, to craft an email or to craft a, a little video. I'm struggling with this, I'm not sure, because that's the opportunity, because you know what to do with those. But many of the parents think that that's a problem. It is the nature of learning. And certainly we have learned that parents have much higher esteem for teachers than they've ever had because of the COVID experience. The interactions of parents with teachers is much more healthy as parents learn that how their children go about the process of learning and how that you have incredible expertise to deal with that. And so you will see some students will be much more increased in their engagement at home. Some of your disruptive students at school won't have the same skills to disrupt at home because there's no one to disrupt in the same way. And so being attentive to how those students are behaving and working in their on their schoolwork is something that will really make a difference. Of course, there'll be some that do worse, but those are the ones that we have to be more attentive to in terms of understanding what they're struggling with and making that a legitimate, powerful, and welcomed conversation. We've done our surveys here in Australia, and this is one based on seven to 9,000 teachers, parents, and students. And these are the top 10 positive aspects and you can see across very common themes across all those ones about working at their own pace, the efficiency notions, the students can engage with their friends more in their work, fewer distractions, and it's interesting they put those two together, that when they work with their friends, they can be quite good at building routines and you helping them build routines of how they go about working with others and structuring material so that it's a desirable thing and using methods like the jigsaw method. And if you've never used it, it's probably the most powerful method, 1.2 effect size, where it deliberately structures that students gain the content knowledge before they go on to the deep knowledge and how kids are made to talk, teach each other about the content and about the deep understanding. And so there are many positives there. Yes, there are some negatives. Yes, it is about screen time. And this is mainly the parents worried about physical activity. Yes, oh my goodness, the additional workload for teachers is enormous. And we should recognize that and, and, and thank the teachers in the ways that we can. Yes, there is reduced direct supervision. But as we, I'm trying to say, that can also turn into one of the advantages of teaching kids how to self-regulate. I spent a lot of time trying to understand which students are most likely to be impacted in a negative way. And it's those students who are most dependent on you in the classroom. Those students who say, what do I do next? Those ones who want to sit back and just do the work as prescribed to them. They're going to struggle at home. 
and that's regardless of where they are on their ability continuum. Those who are, have high levels of stress at school will probably have high levels of stress at home. And there's less structure. So building those routines and helping parents build routines in, an early day, in the early days of setting up parts of their home where it is the right place to do their work. When you sit in this seat, that's when you do your schoolwork. And these are the times you do it. And you look down that list. But my point with this list is don't presume that those students who are disadvantaged at school are necessarily the ones disadvantaged at home. Because there are many of those that are not in that category at school that may be disadvantaged. And the major message is simple. Diagnose, diagnose, diagnose. Spend much more time listening to the students, the struggles they're having, what they're doing, where they're at. Cut back the talking and spend more time in the diagnosis phase. And don't assume that it is necessarily the problem. One of the most powerful things, besides well-being, is a sense of belonging. For the Project Oracle, Morris Galton showed that the biggest predictor of success when students change a class, when they change a school, change a year, is do they make a friend in the first month? So that sense of belonging to this place called school was very powerful. Those kids that were lonely in school and in class may have larger problems when they're more lonely at home. So how do you get that social network of students working together, getting underway in the COVID experience. So don't think of it as just each kid sitting at home. How do they get onto their own Zooms and their own technologies to talk to each other in a structured way around the world to make sure that you give them that sense of belonging? So I do want you also to keep a learning log. So as you go through teaching on distance, Keep your own log and diary about what worked really well. And when the students come back to in class, and I know that first month they're back, it's setting up routines again, it's helping them to sense, get a sense of belonging. But after that first month, why don't you get together as a collective in your school of your teachers and talk about what worked well and say, what are we going to give up from the old grammar of schooling so we can bring back better? This is the time where in your countries that you can truly make the difference. Here in my country, in our various states, some states are having a national inquiry into how we can learn from COVID. Some are running seminars. Some are running, ironically, online Zoom sessions. Um, many schools are asking their teachers to keep the diary. And some schools are actually putting those diaries up on their web pages, uh, some internally for the teachers, some externally. And my point being is that we have to make sure that we use this opportunity to bring back matter because that old school system of talking lots, that's 80% of the students are working on and quite frankly, less are succeeding under, is not good enough. A lot of it does work. A lot of it you'll find does work in the COVID experiment, but a lot also we can learn from what happens as we go into distance learning. And we've written a book on distance learning and you can see what the themes are that of the various chapters in that book. And the argument being is that we start off, as you do when you get on an aeroplane, remember those days you used to get on an aeroplane? The first thing they do to you with the safety demonstration is put your own mask on first. Take care of yourself first before you take care of others. And that's absolutely our message as well. And that's the message for school leaders. How do you make sure that in the COVID experience, each teacher isn't isolated, that they work together? And I've seen some pretty stunning things happening where teachers are starting to share students across years and how we're using teacher aids that are very common in Australia now that we know have typically a zero to negative effect on kids because too often we put those teaching aids with the kids who most need the experts. Under COVID, they're now working with many other kinds of kids, ensuring they're on track, listening and feeding back to the teacher what's working and not working. How do we build that relationship from a distance. And you'll find that for many students, it is a much healthier and stronger relationship. And as you see, going through the various notions of how do you create engaging tasks, particularly, as I've said before, with many steps in terms of success criteria. So my message today is that we know a lot about what's successful in terms of having an impact on the learning lives of students. We need to use that knowledge, as I'm trying to show you here in this book, 
to then adapt, to learn even more what we can do in distance as we don't dictate every part of the day. We don't have the students in front of us all the day. And we can and we must bring back better. It's all about how you think. It's all about you reasoning, asking the questions about what you mean by impact, checking fidelity of your teaching. How well is the task to give students in COVID days being implemented and having the students part of that equation so that they can, in a sense, be part of the curriculum understanding of what's working and not working. You will see a lot, be a lot more open to seeing unintended consequences as opposed to the regular classroom where you do have so much control. You're going to look for your own biases about which students are more successful under COVID and which may not be. And of course, the constant time that you're going to do in the COVID days is have that attention on the impact it's having on students. And you're going to spend a lot more time understanding, particularly other students' points of view, and doing what I would like to see, seeing learning through the eyes of students. These are the big 10 ideas in terms of how we think because it comes back to seeing ourselves as evaluators of our impact. It comes to seeing ourselves as seeing assessment as feedback to us about what worked, what didn't work, how we can collaborate and have this belief and success that we are change agents and strive for challenge, how we can help students seek the feedback. And when we give them feedback, how we're going to have to spend time listening to how they understand that feedback and is there any action where they go next in the feedback because if there's no where to feedback then it seriously can be a problem and not have the same effect how we can explicitly inform students what impact looks like building that relationship and trust so errors are welcomed and have that relentless focus on learning so thank you melina thank you for inviting me here today and i wish you every success and the rest of your virtual conference. Thank you. Muchas gracias, John. Realmente interesante los aportes al Congreso. Vamos a empezar con las preguntas que nos han trasladado quienes asisten a través de la app Compartir. Uh, we have some questions, and the first one is from Guatemala. And it is, uh, does it matter that the students are not in the physical place called school? Well, of course it matters. It's, it means that what you do in the regular classroom is not going to work the same because you don't have that oversight. You can't see the students in the eyes all the time. So yes, it's going to matter dramatically. But I think there are going to be, as I've tried to say in my talk today, there's going to be many advantages of that in terms of what we see are desirable attributes of students, how they can become their own teachers, how they can spend more time thinking about and talking to you about how they learn as opposed to getting things right or wrong. So yes, it is going to make a huge difference, but there are also opportunities in that. Oh, a lot of things to rethink the education. And from Argentina, what are the key points to best exploit distance learning during this pandemic? What do you think? I think the most important point is to structure our material with more steps in the process so that when students are alone and they get stuck, they don't see that as an overwhelming problem. They've got something else they can go on to. So we're going to have to structure it more. We're going to have to spend a lot more time in diagnosis and getting students to be diagnosing what it is they're struggling with, what it is they're being successful with. The same with us as teachers, as we have our one-on-one -on -one time with them, as we have our class sessions with them online, listening to them talk. You'll find very quickly that students don't want to sit there like us and have a lecture online. Um, that is not what they see as, as most valuable. If you're going to do that, make the video and send it out. Don't spend your valuable time with them on lecturing and talking, 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 which is what we do in the regular classroom. Spend yes. the time much more in diagnosis. Thank you. Um, from Bolivia, they want to know, in this moment of reconciling curriculum and content, how does art and music impact in student achievement? What do you think, Sean? Well, that's a, I love that question because in my days when I was a teacher, I was a music teacher. Um, right now, in fact, it's really interesting. I, I, most mornings I watch a concert on um, the, the, the video uh, of, for instance, the University of Melbourne Orchestra. They 
get together online and put together music, um, which is quite fascinating and quite rich. And so I see some incredible opportunities for art and music uh, when students are working at home. And of course, we have to make sure that they are a key part of our curriculum. I don't like the argument that we do art and music because it increases kids' skills in maths and reading. No, they are worthwhile activities in themselves and they're a key part of the curriculum. So I think we have an incredible opportunity here to bring art and music back in. And you'll find kids at home will really enjoy doing you, that music, some of the media they have on, on the social media and, and, and on the computers. Thank you so much. Um, from Colombia, uh, someone asked, you publish uh, visible learning in 2008. What has changed since then in terms of education and learning, positive or negative? Well, I want you to think of evidence, not just the kind of evidence from research studies, but the evidence that you have every day from the interactions with students, from their assignments, from their assessments. And look at that evidence and say, my major job here is to interpret that, to find out what I've taught well, what I haven't taught well, which students I've taught well, what that magnitude is. How do I also refocus my classroom from talking about teaching to talking and listening to learning? How I can make it okay in this classroom so that kids see that struggle is a good thing, that errors are opportunities, that I don't know is a valuable thing? And how do we turn kids on to that challenge of learning. They'll do it in their sport, they'll do it in their computer games. How do we get that focus back on learning and challenge in our classroom? Right, um, because you are a, a great researcher from Mexico, ask, which is the role of evidence in the learning process of our students? Well, I think the biggest change in the last 10 years I've seen is that educators now are seeing the research evidence, such as the work I've done and others, uh, and the visible learning work as part of their normal discussions. I think they're getting much healthier in critiquing it and comparing it to their own evidence. But many years ago, they only used what they saw themselves in the classroom. And as I said in the, in the, in the speech today, then that's about 20% of what happens in the classroom. So they're much more open to other evidence from other teachers, from the research evidence. And I think it's a much healthier profession because of that. Well, thank you so much. There are a lot of ideas to rethink everything. So thank you, Hattie. Thank you, Melena.